David, so. you don't look old enough, but you are a Normandy veteran, Western Europe veteran from 1944-45. Great. What was your job? I was a lieutenant troop leader of five troop A squadron, Sherwood Rangers Yeomanry. That's from Nottinghamshire Yeomanry. How old were you? I was 19 when I was in action against the Germans. I joined the army at 18 on my birthday, and uh, because it was the thing to do, sort of thing, I did a year and a half. It took to train us from being a schoolboy to being, well, we were a man at 18, of course, uh, to the uh, being a lieutenant in able to command a troop of four tanks. And what kind of tanks were, were they at that point? Sherman, Sherman. Fires, yeah. yeah. Four, Fireflies? Fours. No, we had one Firefly later on, but immediately we had Sherman 75mm um, you know, gun tanks. And so you're being sent over to Europe. D-Day happens. You land. When do you land? I went over on D-2. D-Day, of course, was D-Day, but yeah. the regiment went on D-Day. But I didn't know anything about them. I was just a reinforcement. And I took over 16 Cromwell tanks. Um, and so you land two days after that, you take over 16 tanks? Yes, to, to Normandy, yeah. Age 18. Yeah. And what's uh, that like? Because you've got these grizzled veterans. You're t- you know, you're, no, you're... They, were, they, were, they were, no, those people, we had a skeleton crew. I was a reinforcement, you see. And um, we went over just to sort of hand the tanks and the men over. When we we left on D2, as I said, and then we floated about on D3 on a ship which was rather like a snake going over the waves. And we landed at about 4 o'clock on D4. And uh, the first tank, the captain came over and said, get these, he used a very old English word actually to tell me to hurry up. And um, I said to the first tank, right, off you go. And he went down the ramp and uh, it went down and down and woof, upside down, complete with the men in it and disappeared. And we'd obviously, something had gone wrong. I didn't know what it was. And the captain came over and he gave the most enormous ticking off to me for doing it. And uh, I stood there, frightened to death, really. We were, in fact, being machine gunned and, and attacked by Messerschmitt 109s at the time, just occasional ones whizzed over. And uh, so it wasn't really a very nice place to be. I'd rather have been at home with Mum at that time, I'll tell you. So the first tank, did you lose the crew? Was the crew drowned? Yes, yes, only two, only a skeleton crew. Normally a tank's got five people in it. Um, but we just took we were a reinforcement, you see. But so that's your your so, first command in Europe. First yeah. thing that happens is that is the tank lost the tank, yeah, immediately. And what did that do for your confidence? Did you feel awful about that, or did you just keep moving, keep making decisions? Well, I mean, I was a bit concerned about it, to put it mildly, and the captain didn't help because he was blaming me for doing it. Well. I hadn't done anything except tell the bloke to get off the ship, you see. Get to tell the driver to get off the ship. And we went down the ramp and the, I couldn't understand what had happened. Well, then they pulled the ship back. But the point was they put an, a, a sea anchor out with a huge great hawser. And they put the thing into reverse. Fortunately, the tide was still coming in. So they just managed to get the ship off the shore. And just as they did it, the hawser broke with a terrific crack and it came back and it sawed all the sort of funnels and rails and things on the other side of the ship, clean off as if it was a knife. We weren't standing on that side, but if we'd been, if it had come our side, we'd have had it, of course. But the point was that then we came in again and the ramp went down and off we went with the other tanks. Well, 50 years later, I went back and took a photograph of the area of Gold Beach where we landed, and um, it would have got the, the tide was out. And if you look at that area where the tide is, um, uh, the Hamel there, you'll find that the sea has a habit of scooping sort of trenches out. And so we obviously right on the edge of a hole, 
and the tank went by a bit of bad luck. Instead of going into eight foot of water, it went into 18 foot of water. And that was the start. Well, anyway, we got the other, um, uh, the other 15 tanks off, and we were up on the on the shore. And um, the ship, of course, the, on, on the, the, the the crew on the ship were very sort of nervous and edgy about the whole thing. Actually, anyway, we um, I didn't stop to talk to them. We went off, and then of course the. Um, uh, tanks were taken off me very quickly because you know they were needed to fight and um, as far as my men, the men were concerned they were taken away from me and the next thing I knew was I was directed to a thing called the Sherwood Rangers Yeomanry. I'd never heard of the Sherwood Rangers and I met this fellow John Semkin who was the he was a captain because the regiment landing on uh, D-Day the colonel was killed, um, and um, they had various casualties. They lost about ten tanks getting onto the shore, and um, they, but A squadron they were landed dry. They weren't swimming ones, and they went on down to Bayeux, and uh, I joined them at a place called Fontenay, just south of of Bayeux. Uh, on uh, D, it was actually D. Uh, probably I went D five and then D six. What was the bridgehead like at that point? I mean, was it just packed with men and and vehicles and tanks and aircraft overhead? Was it overwhelming? Well, uh, you have to remember essentially one thing about all this, and that is that you're only talking to a peanut. I mean, I was only a little tiny speck, wasn't I? I was a lowly second lieutenant, a mere nothing. And the fact is that we only had our own little bit of the area to look at and see. I mean, we didn't know what was going on. I mean, I didn't even know D-Day was going on. Don't forget, when I got on the boat, the ship, to take the tanks over, I said to the chap, well, I was supposed to just put them on the, put the tanks on and anchor them down. And I thought I had to get off and go and get some more, more tanks. And the chap said, get off. He says, you better look through the porthole. When I looked through the porthole, we were at sea. And I said, well, where are we going? He said, well, France, of course. Well, that was my invasion of France. I mean, I know you've got to have secrecy in, the, in war, haven't you? Essentially, you mustn't tell the other bloke what's happening. And so in the circumstances, that was secrecy gone balmy, wasn't it? Because I had no idea. And, um, and and we just went to France. And that was it. That's how it went. And then you joined a unit that you'd and never met before? And then I joined a unit I'd never even heard of. And the, then the next thing was, of course, that the squadron, the, the squadron leader placed me as a troop leader under instruction from a chap called Neville Fern. He was a lieutenant who'd been with them for some time. And uh, he had to go and do something else. So on D, that I, I did D, one day under instruction. You know, you hear about the fighter pilots having only 25 hours flying and all that. I had one day under instruction. And the next day, I was in charge of the troop. I was in command of, of three tanks we had, first in, of all. In battle? Well, yeah. I mean, but, yeah, but we actually fought, we did some shooting on D6. The day I was under instruction, the first day, and then I mean it was um, yeah, but I, there's nothing very clever about it. I mean it just sort of happens, doesn't it? You know you're there doing it. Well, I, I think it sounds pretty clever to me. So you're leading three tanks. Did did you worry that they wouldn't respect you because you just just turned up or? or... That was a terrible thing. If you really want the truth. The men I was with, it was a first-rate, front-line, well-known tank regiment. One of the best. If you read the history, people like General Horrocks says that the Sherwood Rangers were, you know, one of the top regiments. And the fact of the matter was that these chaps that I was in command of, they, so the sergeant, for instance, was totally hostile to me. He was 40 years old, he'd got a wife and kids at home. He'd had enough in the desert, but he'd done the landing on D-Day. And to be honest with you, a whippersnapper of 14, of 19 years of age coming in, uh, telling him what to do, wasn't on. 
And um, the fact was that he resented me completely, as did the men in the tank. For instance, the first thing we were taught to do as a lieutenant or a tank commander was to have the sights T and A test and adjusted. That means that what you have to do is you take the firing pin out of the main armament, main gun, it's about that long, about the, the thick as my wrist, or just, the, no, thinner, about my thumb like that. And you look up, uh, you, you go around the front of the gun, and if you look at a big gun, you'll see um, there are marks on, it, on the end of the barrel. And what you do is you get a bit of grease and a bit of grass, and make a cross tease on the end of the barrel. You then go back and you aim the gun up until you see uh, what you've probably read off the map, a shirt spar if there's one around, or something anyway, um, a, a target at whatever it is, 500 yards. So you set it at that. Then you go to the sides, which are next door to that, and you adjust those so that you adjust the sight at 500 yards on the sight and lock it, you see, and lock them both. And then when you put a round up the spout, it fires. So I said to these gunner, my gunner, this new chap I was with, uh, on D7, if you like, when I was in charge, um, uh, have you teenage your sights? And he said, uh, what's it could do with you? So I said, everything. And I want to know, have you done it? So he said, no, I haven't, and there's no need to either. This is a trooper talking to a lieutenant. So, mind you, he was much older than me. And so I said, well, I want you to TNA him. He said, they're all right, there's no need to do it. I said, I want you to do them. He, he just wouldn't answer. So I said, okay, I'll do it myself. So I knew telling a lie. The gun was aiming there, and the sights were aiming there. They no more would have shot a tank than jump off the moon. So I put them straight, and I said to him, now I'm telling you, that's the last time you pull that one on me. You see, time will tell. <sighs> Grumble, grunt. Well, the long and the short of it was, I had to fight two enemies. One was my own men, and the other one were the Germans. And the question is, my own men had to be dealt with first, so how do you deal with them? I decided that I was going to show them I wasn't afraid, because they were afraid. They'd seen a tank hit with their friends in it, glowing red sparks coming out, and their men, their friends, are in there. And you see that once or twice. I'll tell you what, you're not too keen about getting in a tank again. Nobody in the regiment, by the way, that I ever heard of, um, uh, uh, there might have been one, but uh, 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 refused to get back in after the tank had been blown up. All our men always went straight back in, and so did we because I came out of three altogether. But the fact of the matter is that um, it was a matter of how was I going to gain their confidence. So what I did was I said, I will lead. Well, leading was the most dangerous thing because the first thing that gets it is the lead tank. But I led my troop all the time, right the way through. And after a bit, they said, this bloke's all right. And they wanted to be in my crew. The people wanted to be in my troop. And we also had another big, big asset. And that was in the shape of our squadron leader, who, when I joined, was only a captain because the major, the, the colonel of the regiment, had been killed when he was having what they call an order group with the infantry, deciding where we were going, what we were going to do the next day. And a shell came down and killed a lot of well, four or five of them. And uh, the, the colonel, therefore, had to be replaced. Well, the second in command didn't want to do it of the regiment. And so they took the next senior 
major who was a chap called Stanley Christopherson. And Stanley Christopherson said, ha ha, he was always laughing. He always made, we all tried to make fun of the whole thing. And I'll explain another point about that in a minute. But the point was that he was always laughing and wanted us to laugh as well. And we did, as young blokes. And we got up to various antics, some of which I'll tell you about. But in principle, he uh, commanded the, the regiment. Um, and so we hadn't, uh, we had got a major in charge of the regiment. That's a colonel's job. So they had to promote him. And then John Semkin, who was the second in command of A Squadron, he as a captain, he was a captain when I joined them. And then he became a major. So the regiment was in a complete turmoil when I joined it. And that's before you have to deal with the Germans. What was the first German vehicle or infantryman that you saw? Uh, a Tiger. A Tiger? Yeah, I would say so. What happened there? Close? Was it? Was well, it... We were t it was just the other side of a hedge going down and um, uh, uh, where we were. Uh, well, it just passed us and then with the, somebody else caught it up later on. You see, one of the other problems was, the, 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 you realise there were only 167 Tigers in Normandy, of which, incidentally, only three got back to Germany, so we did a bit of good, didn't we? But most of them were either Mark IVs or Panthers. And the Panther and the Tiger were totally inviolate against us. Our gun would no more if you tried to shoot at them. I mean, I've actually, what sort of distance are we talking about? About twice the distance from, you see your bookcase down there? Well, twice that distance, roughly, of this building. I mean, I've actually shot at a German panther and, and it's just gone straight off, you know. That's only, that's less than 100 metres. I mean, that's, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, sometimes they would be very close to us, you see. Well, I was talking to you about uh, I'm jumping ahead a bit here, but but um, there was an occasion, for instance, when we were very close to the Germans, and um, the thing was that uh, suddenly over the air came this voice. Our, their radio linked in onto our onto our net, you see, and this bloke calls out, this German calls out, "You English finant, we are coming to get you," and so. You know, larking about, I called down the thing. I said, oh, good, if you're coming over, will you hurry up? Because I've got the kettle on. And the bloke on the end goes, Wah! he got in a great rage about that. You see, Because they could speak perfect English. And we took the mickey on things like that. We had, for instance, we never wore a tin hat. We always wore berries. We didn't have body armour or anything like that. Just as we saw, with your head out at the top of the tank. That's why we had so many casualties. Don't forget the job I was doing, the crew commander. It was av average life was a fortnight. That's all they gave you as a as a lieutenant. And um, this is probably a point about that medal that you see there. What about all those chaps who were killed and they didn't get a medal at all because they were dead? You only get that if you're alive. And uh, I can't help thinking about that because you have to realise that as troop leaders particularly, we used to help one another. If you were another troop leader, you see... I mean, you would not hesitate to help me out if I was in trouble in the same way that I did with you. Unfortunately, one of my friends, he did just that, and he was talking on the air, and suddenly he stopped talking, and he dropped his Sten gun, and it went off on its own, and he just shot up a huge big tank, an uh, uh, anti-tank gun the Germans had, an 88, which was firing at me at Nijmegen. It had got 20 men round it, and they were loading it up and firing them in. I, I would have been a dead duck. I mean, I, it hit me, and I was blinded anyway for about 20 minutes or something like that, and then I found I could see, so it was all right. But uh, it was very, very dicey, and he came along and shot through the trees and shot it up and stopped it. And as he's telling me what he's done, because I didn't realise why it had stopped, you see, and uh, he said, well, how about that, Dave? You see, you feel better now. I said, oh, yeah, right on, Dickie. I, I, um, Harry it was, Harry Heenan. I said, well, I'll see you tonight when we, you know, we'll, we'll have a chat up because we used to have a, a, a rum or something like that to drink, you know, and stuff, and, um, or a cup of tea. And um, he, of course, 
was talking to me and he dropped his stern gun and it went off on its own and machine gunned him. And I have to live with that really, it's hard because I think about him. He was an only son and, and the mother and father wrote letters. They didn't, they never, the padre and the colonel and those sort of people would never let us know the letters and things that were written to the um, uh, to the regiment. They wanted to know where was his watch and whether, well, to be perfectly honest, what happened when the, when the blokes got killed, we just used to share the stuff around. I mean, you see, don't forget, on the back of a Sherman, you didn't have any boxes or anything like that to protect anything. So we were continued being shot at. Don't forget, in a tank, you can't hide behind a tree or nip behind a house double quick. I mean, you're there, and so we were continually shot at. Um, when we were in action, I mean, we weren't continually shot at all the time because we weren't in action all the time. But the truth of the matter was that we hadn't got anything other than what we stood up in because our bed rolls and blankets and uniform and spare kit and everything else was continually being set on fire at the back of the tank, you see. So how many tanks did were you in that were destroyed? I, uh, two, and I was in the third one, but I didn't lose that. I came out of it, but I came out of three tanks in that context. And so but I lost two, but that, that, some lost more than that, of course. Don't forget the Colonel, oh, Stanley Christopherson, came out of five tanks in the desert. Five tanks in one day. What? Hmm. And you fought, so after Normandy, you fought in part of the breakout. Yes, well, we went through Falaise Gap. Yeah. And then... Up north of France, and then well, and then. Well, when we got to Doulon, um, I overran a flying bomb site. I didn't know that it was a flying bomb, but we arrived. We we arrived at a crossroads at Doulon, and um, actually it was Harry Heenan who was uh, because this, he he didn't get killed until we were up in Nijmegen. On the way up there, you see, Harry was lead tank lead at doing it because he very often a lot of the troop leaders like me, did do the leading, you see. Um, and he was in the lead of the whole thing. But we'd been hurtling up the road, doing, you know, got cracking. Once we got cracking, we moved at pretty quick speed. And we got over this hill, and just as he did, wang, he got shot at from a gun that was on the crossroads that we were going over to to get into Doulon. And the fact was that the, this round came on the top of his tank and there was a huge gouge out of the top of his tank about six inches from his head. And uh, so he backed up double quick and we all concertinaed up behind. And I got out of my tank and I went over to John. I said, what the hell is going on? Why aren't we going ahead, you see? John Semkin, this is the major. And I said, well, why aren't we going ahead? He said, well, Barry's just been shot at by a gun down there, you see. So I said, well, wait a minute, look, and I've got my map in my hand, as we usually had. And I said, well, look, if I turn it and go over here at right angles to where we're going, and then I'll do a swoop, because there's a road down there coming in on the crossroads. I'll get on that crossroads road, and then I'll come in, and I'll get the bloke sideways on, you see, because he, 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 he was aiming up there, and I'd be coming in like that. Um, a sort of swoop, you see, which is a thing we very seldom did, but we did, it was done on occasion. Anyway, the point was that as we went, he, John said, OK, if you want to do it, get on with it, you see. So, right, follow me, I said to my troop, and there was, we, we, just, we went off the four tanks, and we went down into a sort of thing where there was a big wall round and all the rest of it. I didn't know what it was. And it was an old ancient sort of fort thing. And in this thing, there was like a ramp with holes in it. You can see one, actually, if you go to Duxford. They've got one there. And uh, there were a lot of little aeroplanes lying there, one, two or three little aeroplane things. And so I said uh, to my gunner, right, I will put a round or two in them. So we sort of shot at these things. I mean, if we'd set one off, we'd have been blown to smithereens, of course. But we didn't know what they were. I just thought they were aeroplanes, you know. But no men about, no Germans. So anyway, we then go, and there's the road. So I said, well, never mind about that damn thing. But we'd overrun a flying bomb, a V1 flying bomb site. And I was ever so proud, because I wrote home and I said, 
done a flying bomb site. That's one that won't be dropping bombs on you. You know, that must have been a good feeling. Yeah. Well, yeah, I felt good about that. Well, and then you you went. But then we came into the thing, and somebody had already shot the gun, and so then we went through um, through Doulon, and we didn't have much trouble. A, f a few Germans, actually. I mean, you know, all the time there was a bloke with a Panzerfaust or a Panzerschreck shooting at you, and you had to be a bit sharp. There were, you see, the big thing about being a troop leader or a proper troop commander was that you had to learn and how to deal with things. You see, John Semkin saved our lives because he taught us how to fight the blinking Germans. Think about it for a minute. Our guns just wouldn't knock the German tanks out head on at all. And if you made a slight mistake, you were a dead duck. Uh, just as quick as that. I mean, they, there was no messing about. The Germans were very sharp folks. And so we had to be sharper. And all I can say is that John, you see, a lot of squadron leaders, we had one after he had a nervous breakdown and backed up at Garnagurgen, because it got to him in the end. He realized that the top brass were ever so, ever so upset about sending the young boys to their deaths, literally. And it got to John, and he had a nervous breakdown. And uh, we had another chap in who, uh, squadron leader, uh, Major, and I fell out with him because he didn't know his job, if you want the truth. And I said, you know, I, I won't go into the detail of it, but I said, we definitely can't cope with you because, you know, Anyway, going back to the... Uh, so you fought through Nijmegen, obviously part of the Arnhem campaign, but then you fought in Germany as well, didn't you? Oh, yeah, of course. What was Germany like? Oh, that was worse. It was, wasn't it? Well, they got the ump, you see, because we were in their land, weren't we? Um, if you talk about Cleve, for instance, where that's near the rice wall, we the whole regiment was in a line going up through uh, up this road, and on the left-hand side, there were a number of houses, pairs, and then there was a gap where the garages should have been, hadn't been built, and then another house, you see. And suddenly, I was actually taken out, because they did take you out of a tank for perhaps two or three days or something like that, just to give you a blow. The padre, or particularly the doctor, um, would keep an eye on the young blokes and say, well, he's had enough for a bit, get him out and let him have a, a little day or two off, you see. And um, so they were very, very considerate like that. Uh, they, they, and anyway, we're in this line, and I'm in a Humber, a little tiny Humber armoured car. And I've got a driver, no arms or anything like that, no gun on it or anything. And um, the point was that... Uh, suddenly one of the tanks, our tanks, about four or five vehicles up in front of me, because I was the LO liaison officer to the colonel. In other words, I'd like a gopher I was, but I didn't have to do anything. I just tagged behind him, you see. Anyway, the point was that um, this tank suddenly erupted, you see, and suddenly there was another one behind us erupted. And then another, and the next minute I'm sitting there with the lid off this thing open, the uh, top of the uh, lead, uh, the, uh, the, the hatch above was open, and suddenly there was a whacking great bang, and the thing rocked, you see, and the inside of the armoured car was illuminated with a brilliant white light, just for a flash of a second. And I said, well, what was that? And I used a few old English words, actually, and I stuck my head up and I looked, and when I turned around and looked, I was looking straight down the barrel of a Yag Panther uh, with an 88. And it was aiming at me. Well, fortunately, what had happened was he couldn't quite depress his gun because I'd only got such a little vehicle, you see. And when he fired, the, the white is the trace that's on the back end of a, an armoured um, uh, 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 AP, armoured piercing 
uh, round, which is a solid lump of steel weighing 22 and a half pounds, which moves incidentally at faster than the speed of sound. And that had whizzed over my head, and that was the white light as it went over, you see, the, 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 the phosphorus. Well, are you alive? And to... I was very lucky to uh, get away with it because then, having fired, he didn't waste any time. He backed up and he wanted to get off and have another go at another one. But can you imagine? That was a near squeak, wasn't it? Are you, are you alive today through good luck or because you were good at your job? Um, well, they missed a lot of times, uh, but not all the time they didn't miss me, no. Um, I would be say I would say in principle I'm alive today because John Semkin kept us he thought about how to deal with them and he told us a system of dealing which I'll tell you about. But the point was that you see, most of the time the squadron leaders didn't think about it. They just said, All right, well we've got to go there, so right over um, four troop, five troop, whatever it was, go there, you see. Well, John didn't do that. He thought, how are we going to do it, not lose the tanks? And he decided that he would get hold of us, the four of us, and he said, now look, you must fire for about a quarter of an hour before you move. Brass the area up before you move. Because when you're being shot at, you cringe. And so consequently... That's what we did. We would fire for about a quarter of an hour. And then whilst the tanks were firing, I would then let them know that I was moving my troop. And then, because don't forget, I had a troop section and we were very much on our own. I mean, it was my war that we fought that little bit. Um, and so I, and there was no question. I mean, John would come over the air and tell us which way to go and things like that. But when it came to the actual, you know, dealing with the Germans and fighting them, it was the troop leaders who did it, you realise, not the colonels or the majors. But anyway, long and the short of it was that I would then advance with them firing past me and then I'd get up and in amongst the Germans and then brass them up, um, you know, right close up get to up them. Get up close. Yeah, get in amongst them, you see. It was all a bit dicey. <laughs> That's the biggest understatement I've ever heard. <laughs> and now you've written a book. Well, I, we're being helped to write a book, yes. What's it going to be I, called? Tank Action, it's called. Tank Action. Yes. Um, so like that you. will tell you quite a bit about it. Well, I'm looking forward to reading that. And when were you, when did, were you demobbed after the war? Uh, well, I, when the war was over, I was still four months off being 21. So they said, right, oh, you, you can go to Japan now and do the landing on Japan. And so I thought, well, I won't come back from that, but never mind. Because we never expected to survive, you realise. I mean, you know, we, but if, if you might say to me, um, you know, were you afraid or anything like that? Well, the answer is no. And how did we stand it? Well, the answer was we got numb to it. I, I liken the situation to when, you know, when they made... Well, you wouldn't know because you're too young, but they made the M1, and I can remember people saying, Phew, I'm not going up that motorway, it's jolly dangerous, I'm not going on that. Literally. Well, now you don't think about going up the M1, do you? I mean, what's wrong with that? Well, that was the same, if you can appreciate what I'm getting at, that was the same sort of attitude that we adopted. We knew we were going to get killed, but actually, I don't think it was going to be me, I think it would be the other bloke, really. Uh, but in principle, um, we got numbed to it. That was the real point. And um, it, it just accepted the situation and we lived by the day and all the rest of it. One of the big problems, of course, was that it went on for so long. If you look at the um, reason why the French have been kind to us and given us a medal, uh, is because I they worked it out. I did 89 days of fighting in France. Not continuous, because we used to do, they tried to give us 10 days in action and five days out. But we didn't always get that at all. They move us on, you know. And um, But, I mean, 
if you were a prisoner of war, I'm not decrying people who are prisoners of war or in concentration camps, but they, a lot of them had a reasonable expectation they were going to wake up in the morning. We didn't. Don't forget, we have a number of people, you, I can take you to a gravestones in Bayer, where the Royal Armoured Corps was the overall holding thing of the, of the tanks. And then you had the Royal Tank Regiment and the Nazio and the Derbyshire Yeoman and all of the rest of them. In other words, you, you were in the Royal Armoured Corps and then you were sent off to an individual unit. But when, then you'd have a different cat badge, you see. But the point is, the original one is on the gravestone of three chaps who we know in Bayer who were in our tanks. Well, why have they got those original badges up? Well, the answer is because they were reinforcements who came in to take the place who were fellows who were killed in the tank yesterday. And they got in the tank at, say, 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock in the morning. And by midday, they were dead for the simple reason that the, the lorries that came up with fuel and ammo and cat badges and so on, um, well, they don't come up until night time. So these boys hadn't done a day's fighting. They were killed. Don't forget, a lot of people, and they, when we did this medal thing in the, uh, uh, you know, the presentation in the French embassy the other week, um, a lot of the people... Um, I'd only had 25 minutes of war in France and that was their war well can you imagine what it's like going day after day after day after day after month after month I mean we were absolutely knackered at the end of it well all I can and say and then is... it wasn't the end of it because we had to do Belgium I mean we had a thing called Giel in Belgium which was horrendous and then we had Holland I did a talk to the Dutch. Um, they got me to go over there and I did six talks in five days for them because it was their anniversary of liberation. But they made a terrific fuss of us, I must say. Well, I'm not surprised. You deserve to have a fuss made out of you. No, no, I don't. I no. just, oh. I'm only one of thousands, don't forget. And, and how important was I tiny? I only had a little front to deal with, don't forget. Well... David, you've given us a sense of what it was like. Good luck with the launch of the book. And thank you very much for talking to us today. It's been a great honour.